My name is David Fallis, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce a segment for the Ethics of Song series at the Centre for Ethics at the University of Toronto. The song and the piece I would like to introduce is not one that I have known for a long time. It was introduced to me by a group of a couple of friends, actually, who are part of a larger group of friends who have gotten together for many years to eat and talk together, and often singing is part of our camaraderie. People will just bring along a song that they've encountered and they, that they think the rest of us would enjoy. And a couple of months ago, one of the offerings was Tiny Perfect Moles. Tiny Perfect Moles is not really a piece that was designed to go together. It's a compiled piece. And by that I mean that the words come from one place and the music from somewhere altogether different. The words, the lyrics, are by Margaret Atwood from her novel The Year of the Flood. The Year of the Flood, as many of you will know, is part of the Mad Adam trilogy, uh, which concerns itself with uh, people trying to adapt to a global, uh, disastrous global pandemic. I should say that The Year of the Flood was published in 2009, some 11 years before our current COVID-19. Most of the central characters in The Year of the Flood are members of a religious group called God's Gardeners. The group is readying themselves for what they call the waterless flood, the pandemic which may destroy all life on earth. The members of the God's Gardeners are devoted to saving as many species of, of the animal kingdom as they can. They are vegetarians, they grow vegetables and raise bees on slum rooftops, and they gather together to worship, to listen to short sermons, and to sing hymns from the God's Gardener's Oral Hymn Book. Their church year has saints days and celebrations, and one of those is called Mole Day. For Mole Day, the hymn text is as follows. We praise the tiny perfect moles that garden underground, the ant, the worm, the nematode, wherever they are found. They live their whole lives in the dark, unseen by human sight. The earth is like the air to them, their day is like our night. They turn the soil and till it, they make the plants to thrive, the earth would be a desert if they were not alive. The little carrion beetles that seek unlikely places return our husks to elements and tidy up our spaces. And so, for God's small creatures beneath the field and wood, let us today give joyful thanks, for God has found them good. Margaret Atwood said that in writing the words for the God's Gardener's Hymn Book in the Year of the Flood, she was influenced by William Blake and John Bunyan. Indeed, I think these lyrics have a wonderful direct simplicity, even a kind of naive quality, which is very appropriate to the lifestyle of the God's Gardeners in the Year of the Flood. I understand that the lyrics, the hymn, the hymn words, have been set to music in a variety of ways, but as I mentioned, I was encountered these the tiny perfect moles for the first time through my friends who had learned the song from another dear colleague, Alan Gasser. Alan does a great deal of community music making of all kinds, and he knows a lot about hymn tunes. And he realized that the words for tiny perfect moles would fit very beautifully to an old American hymn tune which actually comes from a, an American hymn book uh, published first in 1835. The name of the tune in this uh, early publication is called Dove of Peace. Here's what the original music looks like. Those of you who read music will notice that the notation of this music is a little unusual. The note heads, instead of all being round, have a mixture of square, triangular, and circular shapes. In fact, this old hymn book was printed in what is called shape note notation, where the shape of the note head helps you place the note in the musical scale. It was a notational system used in a number of hymn books of the time and in early American singing schools. Allen took this basic source from 1835 and underlaid the words from the year of the flood. In both versions, the main tune is in the middle part. This is what it sounds like. We praise the tiny perfect moles that garden underground. The ants, the worm, the nematode, wherever they are found, wherever they are found. 
What a beautiful melody. When it appears in modern hymn books, it is usually attributed as traditional or folk, which means we don't really know who wrote it. Somebody did, but they are unremembered. What I like about the lyrics, and this is where I think it begins to lead us into ethical considerations, is the clear respect that it ha the words have for all living creatures, even those who traditionally have been regarded as beneath our dignity, even worthless. The lyrics mention worms. And uh, I have to admit that as a musician that's done a lot of Baroque music, especially sacred Baroque music, I have encountered many examples, too many examples, where uh, the worm stands for the epitome of worthlessness. In Purcell's lovely song, Lord, What is Man?, there is a line that for a worm a god should die. And the works of J.S. Bach, which for many of us contain some of the world's most incredible music, have uh, countless lyrics where, which suggest that humanity is so debased that we are all like worms. Well, I suppose we could debate whether humanity is debased, but that doesn't mean we are like a worm. God's gardeners know better, and the hymn asks them to praise the creatures whom we so rarely see working and living as they do in the soil. It takes careful observation, often on your hands and knees, to even notice them. But surely careful observation and experience of another living creature is a prerequisite to praising them or loving them. And of course today we are becoming more and more aware of how important ants and worms and nematodes are in maintaining the health of soils. Margaret Atwood has always had this ecological perspective, but I love the way that in the guise of a rather four-square hymn, she slyly encourages this new perspective. In a more sophisticated example taken from her more rather more serious poetry, she writes of reindeer moss, that wonderful creature that is not a moss at all, but a lichen, and therefore a combination of algae and fungus, the original examples of symbiosis. Reindeer Moss on Granite This is a tiny language, smaller than Gallic. When you have your boots on, you scarcely see it. A dry, scorched dialect with many words for holding on, and with grey branches like an old tree's, brittle and leafless. In the rain they go leathery, then sly like rubber. They send up their little mouths on stems, red-lipped and round, each one pronouncing the same syllable, O, oh, O, oh, O, oh, like the dumbfounded eyes of minnows. Thousands of spores or rumors infiltrating the fissures, moving unnoticed into the ponderous is of the boulder, breaking down rock. We could probably discuss Margaret Atwood's ethical stance through the lens of tiny perfect moles for much longer, but the ideas and images of the song also make me think of one of the greatest ethicists and activists I have ever had the privilege of meeting, Ursula Franklin. Ursula Franklin was a renowned scientist, political and social activist, a leading voice for Canadian feminism, and a person committed to pacifism. I had the privilege of getting to know her because she and her husband Fred were great supporters of the Toronto Consort and I would see them often at our concerts. Ursula was keenly aware of the ethical implications of her commitment to peace and justice, and she had an incredibly insightful mind on virtually every topic that ever came up in conversation. She created wonderful metaphors for the ethical life. As a musician, I was attracted to the way she once answered a question about how she had developed such an exquisitely developed conscience. She said, you tune it like an instrument. You know, when people start singing, they develop their ear. They begin to hear dissonances they didn't hear before. You become attuned to having to make responsible and moral decisions. It's like singing. At every point you say, am I in tune? You develop your conscience as you develop your hearing, and then you begin to hear smaller dissonances that you didn't used to hear. She also articulated what 
was called her earthworm theory of civic engagement. She said, social change will not come to us like an avalanche down the mountain. It will come through seeds growing in well-prepared soil. And it is we, like the earthworms, who prepare the soil. We also sow thoughts and knowledge and concern. We realize there are no guarantees as to what will come up. Yet we do know that without the seeds and prepared soil, nothing will grow at all. We need more earthworming. So perhaps we can listen to tiny perfect moles in that light, that it is a metaphor for the way we can work together towards a better world. It assumes, of course, that worms and soil changers may seem to be doing nothing. As the hymn says, a lot of the work is unseen by human sight. And like the carrion beetles, we may be called to work in unlikely places. But I believe Ursula is correct. We need to work like earthworms. So here is Tiny Perfect Moles, sung by Alan Gasser and Becca Whitla and their daughter Emma Whitla. Lo, 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 We praise the tiny perfect moles that garden underground. The ant, the worm, the nematode, wherever they are found, wherever they are found. They live their whole lives in the dark, unseen by human sight. The earth is like the air to them, their day is like our night, their day Oh, 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 oh. 